So the way to make this more interesting, your paddling can be, is don't don't entrench the incumbents. Don't give them rules and laws that are only they can abide by. And that's the risk of, of, of regulation and legislation, is that it will, it will have the exact opposite effect of, uh, of what they intend. Hello and welcome to Mentor Dialogue, episode number 335. Today is Sunday, the 7th of July, 2019, and this interview is with Fabrice Kanda. Fabrice is an entrepreneur, speaker, and renowned angel investor. In fact, he was ranked number one in Forbes, nearly two times a second place person, based on investment volume and number of exits. Fabrice has invested in banner names such as Alibaba, Airbnb, Dropbox, Tencent, Uber, and Palantir. He's currently co-founder of FJ Labs, a venture capital PE company, investing in ambitious founders, solving big problems. Previously, Fabrice founded and successfully sold several startups, including Auckland, a European version of eBay, Zingy, and OLX, the alternative to Craigslist. In this conversation, we talk about the key to his success, some lessons learned, and a dive into his own life pivot. Fabrice is a vivid and well-known speaker and a force of nature. Welcome to the Minter Dialogue podcast, where we discuss branding and all things digital. I am Minter Dial, your host, and you'll find the show notes on my eponymous site, MinterDial.com. Enjoy the show. Fabrice Granda. I say Granda because uh, I've got the Franco-American thing going on. Um, you and I have known each other for a few decades, and yet I've never had you on the podcast. Uh, though I did, must say, Fabrice, that I, I went back into my uh, archives and I saw that I started quoting you back in 2007 on my blog. So the relationship has been <clears throat> mostly offline, but lots of online too. And so Fabrice, in your own words, thanks for coming on the show. Tell us how you describe yourself. I guess I'm a um, combination of uh, entrepreneur and investor. And uh, on, on the professional side, and I guess on the, on the personal side, I describe myself as an aspiring polymath and a renaissance man with a huge uh, swath and variety of interests and um, that I try to yeah, have lead a complete and wholesome life. I love the fact <clears throat> that you split into the personal side because in the end of the day when you ask somebody who they are a lot of people that define themselves by what they do or the title they have and it feels so awkward for so many people in business to move into the personal side no no absolutely look at the end of the day we are not what we do and what we do is a part of our lives and a pretty fundamental and important part but not the only one and uh and in in my case what i do is actually a reflection of the things i like and the person i am as a whole and on and, and on the personal side and that's why uh, uh i think both matter and complement each other and the in, in, in multiple times in life where i thought through okay what is it I, that i should do next professionally it came from Am I actually satisfied with my lot in life? Uh, what are the fundamental things that matter to me? What are the compromises I'm willing to make in order to focus on the things that matter the most to me? And then presumably also the price you're prepared to pay because you have Absolutely. to, when you make choices, you have to sort of cut stuff off or people off or, or activities that you might think you like, but aren't necessarily core to who you are. Absolutely. In your, in the New York times article that was published um, four years ago, I guess, you talked about this whole radical, um, I, I feel it felt like a radical revolution of sorts where you really uh, looked at your personal life in the same way you might look at a professional life. Can you tell us in your words how what that journey was? Yes. Um, I was at a pretty profound transformation of my life. I'd, I'd had gone through a personal, a massive professional pro transformation as I reached even in a way the pinnacle of my career. I was like a uh, CEO of a 5,000 employee company in 50 countries with 350 million unique visitors a month and doing extremely well and regarded as a leader in my field and yet realized that I was not as happy and satisfied as was, I, I had been in the past when we were in a much smaller organization, mostly because the nature of the job had changed. And so 
I actually took the decision to go back from zero on a professional level and uh, leave the company that I had created and founded. This and despite the visib- public visibility accolades and frankly the, the 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 platform that it was that was extremely successful. And while I was doing that on the professional side, I, I decided it would make sense to redo the same thing or do the same thing on the personal side. And I realized that as we get older. Um, in a way, our friendships fray or become less meaningful because while we were younger and we spent all of our times, all of our days, you know, remaking the world and we would spend hours a week together thinking about the future of our lives and humanity. As we get older, we get busy and we get busy with work. We get busy with obligations, children, school, et cetera. And all of a sudden, these relationships where you see your friends four or five times a week transform into those where you see each other once every other month and and as such by nature of the fact that you're not seeing each other that often then it becomes a biographical catch-up oh in the last two months since i last talked to you this was what my husband has been up to this is what my wife has been up to these are the kids are working you no longer have these profound conversations on the nature of life and the meaning of our lives and and while it's nice because these are people we'd like and we'd like to hear about them it, it, it felt that it, it, it was not as uh, profound as it could be and it had been. And I'm like, you know, when you own assets and you have things, you allocate a lot of time to them. They're the default path. And so mm-hmm. I decided to get rid of all my material possessions to, in order to free up time to actually try to rekindle with my friends. Now, a lot of the things I tried in that period failed. You made the original originally I went down to essentially fifty items that all fit in my carry on uh, suitcase, backpack and, hmm. and and tennis bag. And my vision was I'm gonna go and couch surf on my friends' couches for a year or two and it'll be an amazing way to rekindle with them because basically I'll be living with them. But mm-hmm. uh Benjamin Franklin once said uh that house guests like fish start swelling after three days. And he was totally right. I mean, the issue is embedding yourself in people's lives when their lives haven't changed and they still have they, you know, their traditional obligations of school and work, et cetera. Uh, that doesn't actually work. And so I, it took a lot of iteration to find a model that made a lot more sense and ultimately got there. Uh, but I, it, it did lead um, to a pretty profound life transformation. Frankly, Coming to the realization that I think many others have had that the material possessions are not that irrelevant. At the end of the day, it's the friendships, relationships, and experiences you have that are more compelling. So, the fact that you did that um, is is wonderful and remarkable. Do you think that it should have been done earlier, or was it just done at the right time? Or the, inshallah, you, when you do it, when you do it. In my case, it was the right time. I wasn't really in a position to do it earlier because uh, I didn't. I did. I, I was overly busy in a way with uh, the companies I built. I all, I built three comp- companies successfully. Uh, you know, from zero to I mean, in one several every case, hundreds of employees, mm-hmm. uh, over a hundred million revenues, uh, and traveling the world, and and didn't spend that much time thinking through uh, what was the proper life design or, or or allocation of resources and time to various things. And it just so happened that as I chose to leave uh, one company, create a natural breaking point for thinking through okay. Um, what should I do next? Now, the what's more interesting is it didn't actually come from, oh, um, leaving the company, now I have time, let's just think about it. It actually was ex ante to that, or, or while I was CEO and had reached this supposed pinnacle, I realized it was not as satisfied as I'd been in the past, and I went through this uh, very thorough and analytical decision-making process to evaluate, okay, what are the options available to me? What is it I should do? And it came up with this framework for both personal and professional life decisions that led me down this path. And But unless I'd had all these life experiences before, I'm not sure I would have come to the right or the, at least this type of conclusion. Yeah. So in my case, it was definitely the right time. And I don't think uh, – yeah, I don't regret not doing it earlier, and 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 the same is true of many things in in, in my in my life. You know, if I look at uh, as a kid, I was very introverted, very shy. I didn't really I, have any I friends. I confirm. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I didn't have many friends. Uh, um, 
and I, I didn't start dating until I was like 27. So I'm a very, in many ways, I was a very late bloomer. And so people often ask me, uh, you know, do you regret not having a more traditional childhood where you had friends, uh, etc.? And and the reality is not really. I mean, the given how how happy I am with the outcome and where life uh, uh, has led me to be today, it, it, it's hard uh, to want. It, it, to to have wanted anything else, and by the way, on a daily basis, I was really happy, right? Like the I'm built happy, and mm-hmm. so even though in in the you, you could be you could be both lonely and happy, and mm-hmm. uh, and and I was really fulfilled, right? Like as a kid, where I had my computer, I had my dog, I had my tennis racket or paddle racket, and. And I read like insane amounts of books. I think I was still I was already at like a hundred book a year back then, as mm. I am still today. And life was I felt like I got everything I ever needed. And so you know, getting A pluses and doing the things I wanted to do. And so the yeah, no, no real regrets. Uh, have I made mistakes? Oh yeah, countless <laughs> and boundless mistakes. And there are uh, many things um, you know from that perspective that I've learned from. But at the same day, like e- even the first startup that failed massively, it was a massive public blow up where it went from hero to zero, you know, the star of the internet bubble to um, to a total failure where I lost everything. The for a variety of reasons, uh, but you know, I didn't pick the right investor. I didn't. I didn't. I was 23. I didn't even know what a stock purchase agreement was, so I didn't negotiate the right rights like a drag and, and et cetera. And but in you know, had I and I mean, so I almost made twenty, one hundred twenty million dollars when I was like twenty five. Uh, but I had, had I done that, I probably would be an insufferable air <laughs> prick. And and so even from that perspective, you know, the learning, the uh, failing uh, so publicly and massively uh, was a lesson in humility that I think I needed to learn. And so mm. even then, it's hard to regret, uh, given that ultimately things did work out. Uh, the okay, be- despite it meant you know living in New York and such two dollars a day for a while. Yeah, it's the benefit of hindsight, as you put it on. The reason why I asked that question, I mean, obviously, um, I, and I really subscribe to this idea of personal and professional being something that you merge, and and you are particularly interesting because in your position, uh, despite all your busyness and the amount of stuff you do on the professional side, you're extremely transparent insofar as you even put your weight on your site, your, your, how many pounds you weigh. Um, I mean, that, how, how much more can we put out there? The only thing I was going to suggest about that was maybe you should connect it to some device that does it every day. So you have it, you know, but, um, the point is I do, that actually. you do, I see. <laughs> I, I have a Fitbit and I have my, uh, scale and I, right. I, 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 I calculate everything. I try, right. I, I, you know, like, uh, I think many people track a lot of things in their lives to improve it. I track my sleep. I track the steps I do every day. I track the calories I burn. I, Et cetera, et cetera. So I want to get back into that in a second, but um, the point I was going to raise was that for people who are in business, and, and I count, you know, I meet a lot of these types of very successful, big, big entrepreneurs, big um, business people, and the challenge is when to get off the treadmill at some point. It's not get off, but at least uh, embrace the personal side and and the amount of energy that can bring back to you and and more profound happiness. You said a comment. I can be happy and lonely. I would argue that the the strongest happiness is the one that knows how to do it when they're lonely. Because if you rely on others for your happiness, then, I mean, it is a happiness, but it's not as profound. And, and you know, when you have your own internal private happiness, it can radiate into everything else you do. Absolutely. Though, though people are built differently. I mean, so if you're an extrovert and you get a lot of energy from being around other people, your your core happiness may come from actually being surrounded by other people. If you're an introvert, uh, actually alone time where you're reflecting, thinking, etc., may be the man of, of 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 core satisfaction. And I, I'm actually kind of on the margin between the two, and love. Uh, and I'm being surrounded by friends and family and and love being alone and, and I set up my life in a way to do those two things. But you're right, many people don't have a very good life balance and they don't do things they love. Um, I think it kind of depends on what drives you and, and if you're driven by and 
not a fear is the right word, but you're by insecurity. If you're driven by like, oh, I need to live up to my parents, uh, my families, or societal expectations, or your own personal expectations of of what you can or should be doing, um, that that could be a fantastic motivator. But it's not going to lead to a very healthy life and and to you a very good life work balance. Um, in my case, I, I love what I do. I do what I love, and and I I realized that the the playtime of like going survival training in the jungle and heli skiing and playing paddle and organizing intellectual salons I, I think is an integral part of who I am and mm-hmm. and of actually allowing me to be who to do what I do and 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 I think there's a lot of value that people un, underestimate of. If you have a lot of knowledge of a lot of things, it, that the ability to draw analogies between topics to to, it, it, to, to try to get some form of gestalt, mm. I think, is pretty powerful and and massively undervalued. And you know, think of the things I read. I don't read business books. I read books about philosophy, life, uh, people's biographies, or even fiction, and mm. all of these things. I think, even though they're not directly applicable to what I do professionally, I think actually are helpful. They, they keep your mind open and your heart open. And, and at the very least, it makes for a more fulfilling life. I mean, connecting these dots and different interests. I also think it's absolutely fundamental in business. The area I wanted to get into, Fabrice, was, you know, since you and I are have the opportunity to meet so many people in, in interesting positions, you, you see them and you, you see them, you know, working hard, uh, getting in the performances, buying the new Bentley, and, and and yet I feel that so many of them don't open themselves up into their personal side. It's sort of, that's a private side, or I don't want to have a personal brand. I don't want to be on Twitter. I don't want to be out there. What, 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 how would you advise people about that? I mean, do you, do you think it's a, uh, it's totally fine, everyone can do whatever they want? Or do you think that there is a better way in this new world where we have so much transparency, authenticity, topics, and devices that you, if you will, I can connect all that, that you as in an executive role ought to more embrace your personal side? I actually think the questions are somewhat different because uh, I think embracing your personal side in life, I think is important and trying to have a good effective work-life balance, whether you're public about it or not, that is a personal decision and I don't think it's for everyone. Uh, my business partner is a very private person and doesn't share everything. I don't think you can find a photo of him online anywhere and that's totally fine. That, that's the way he feels more comfortable and at ease operating the world. I'm a very open, transparent and radically honest person in a way and everything there is to know about me is online and I have no shame of being who I am and, and I'm happy to share it. Um, that said, because of time allocation, limited time, I don't actually use social media very much or very uh, probably effectively. Yes, I have, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and I use them maybe once a year every few weeks to, to post some one of my blog posts, and that's basically it. Uh, I don't engage much more than that. I, I, I just don't have time. And, and where is it that I want to allocate time? Yeah, I don't think that's a I, – I think – spending time writing and thinking and then sharing that on my blog, which then I distribute in social media, mm-hmm. I think is somewhat interesting. But beyond Absolutely. that, uh, beyond that, I not, not so much. Uh, and I find that very, and I find that to be very fulfilling. But yeah. uh, by, if it was like documenting my life every day and like, Oh, look at me seeing my life as eh, not, not that compelling. Sure. No, but I, I think that doing blog posts is a social activity online and whether or not you use social media per se but i i, I mean I, I very much i think i the, the point for me is is usually find the medium or media that are appropriate for you if you like to take photographs or you like to take images um video or you like to write you like to write long form you like to write short form you like to use sarcasm humor whatever find your your tone but i i, t- I tend to encourage going out one of the things I wanted to ask you about, and we mentioned this the last time we chatted, was um, this notion of privacy and and who should, let's say, monitor, even legislate the ideas. So we have this ongoing debates that we're talking about 
uh, whether we should be um, overseeing Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple, so on, on the way that they deal with our personal data. That that whole topic. How what's your take as to how this is going, how this should and is going to play out? I find that people, to be honest, are overly concerned about privacy. At least legislators are, because when you think of like the the trade that consumers are making, uh, it's it, it seems like a fair one. Is I get access to all this these services for free. In exchange, you get access to some of my data that I'm actually willingly choose to share with you, in which you're in a position to monetize, which I'm not in a position to monetize. I mean, they did a few interesting tests. So first of all, if you had all of your data about you, no one would be willing to buy that for you at any price. It's not ma- meaningful and valuable to you. It's only the aggregate data about a lot of people that it, you can actually use uh, to sell advertising against. And so frankly, even Google and Facebook cannot sell that data. They can only use it for themselves for to, to serve more relevant ads, et cetera. And that's why they ultimately have these network effects that have allowed them to build the companies and the modes that they've built. The, I think they did a survey of like, would you be willing to pay like a dollar a month for Facebook or a dollar a month for WhatsApp or a dollar a month for Google? And the answer is no. Um, and so the, 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 the trade-off between uh, that the consumers seem to be making seems to be a fair one especially since they were not in a position to monetize their well especially if they if they actually don't value it somehow correct well it's not that no but it's they can't value it because it's not valuable in a way like the your data is you there's no one who would pay for your data in in the at the individual level it's only the aggregate that it can be used by a few companies effectively and so the, it actually isn't valuable, which is why it's not valued, unless except in very specific cases. And so, um, and I've seen it like they've done survey. And by the way, I want the, those companies to have my data. Like, if I have to choose, um, I go to YouTube, but YouTube recommends videos that are completely accurate to me. And if I look at what's trending, it's so fundamentally different from the things that I look uh, that I, I wouldn't want to have the average. I want things specific to me. Same thing when I'm on Google and I search for something, I, I like that they give me searches that are relevant to the things I'm interested in, that the ads that display are relevant to me. I don't know, like people worry way too much about these things. But then again, I'm a very open and transparent person and I value the user experience that, that I have. Um, if for whatever reason you were particularly concerned about privacy, you could actually get a browser, be in anonymous mode, and have nothing tracked uh, if you really cared about it. So I, I'm not sure. But my, my fear about what legislators are doing is by imposing all these rules and laws, et cetera, the only the very big companies can actually comply to them because they cost a lot of money. And so it will entrench Facebook and Google forever. And as a startup, I actually, and as a startup supporter and a startup builder, I want a level playing field, and, and and I want the barriers to entry to be as low as possible, and I want the cost of operating to be as low as possible. And so the way to make this more interesting, compelling to me, is don't don't entrench the incumbents, don't give them rules and laws that are only they can abide by, and that's the risk of, of, of regulation and legislation is that it will it will have the exact opposite effect of uh, of what they intend. I mean, the the road to to hell is paved with good intentions, and when you see the idiocy of the legislators and the congressmen when they interview the Facebook or Google executives and Congress, and then you think these are the people that are going to be passing the laws, um, I worry that they're going to pass completely counterproductive and idiotic laws. Staying in that vein, going down that rabbit hole, you mentioned watching YouTube there. I don't have the statistics to, to back up what I'm about to say, but there are people that talk about the fact that YouTube will feed you what you want to hear, but also tend to feed into your fears. Because once you tap into the fears, you're like, oh, that's really scary. <gasps> then I'll watch that. And I get into the next thing and it, it leads you down a path that tends to be rather divisive or at least polarizing. And in the context uh, in which I was talking about where the Global Editors Network, we're talking about the future of media. Obviously, the algorithms that are feeding are us back items that might be what we want in the case of Fabrice Ganda, get what he gets what he wants. But a lot of times we're talking about seminating, inseminating different narratives that um, are having an impact on democracy. 
the well media has always had an impact on democracy and if you think uh on the offline world you've had uh newspapers that represent different points of views and people have had a tendency forever and before social media and before youtube to buy the newspapers that reinforce their beliefs and that's true in you know in the uk and it's true in the us and the people that were reading uh the New York Times were, had very different views than the people that were uh, uh, reading the Wall Street Journal uh, or, or the New York Post, and and that's totally okay. Now, the can social media amplify these messages and be used uh, counterproductively? Yes, but I find it's very dangerous to want to police uh, speech. I think it's Voltaire who once said, uh, I fundamentally disagree with what it is you say, but I'm willing to die for you to be able to say what you have to say. And, and, and this notion that because we disagree with some points of view, they should be banned or, or blocked or policed is anti-intellectual and, and, and counterproductive. I, I actually want the debate of ideas to be there and, 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 and a variety of viewpoints to be out there. And even though some people will, will self-select it, um, now, in terms of what I, I, what I what I would recommend as effective media consumption, by the way, is do not consume news. News in its present form in 2019 is essentially negative uh, entertainment, and and it, 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 our amygdala is addicted to these negative forms of yeah. information. And there's nothing that relevant. The the relevant news, which doesn't happen in the news cycle of 24 hours. It is is much slower moving, but much more profound. I mean, if we think of what are the most relevant news of the last twenty years, it's something like a billion people came out of poverty in in India and and in and in China. Uh, the we've had like eight or seven of the top ten fastest growing economies in the world in the last decade have been in Africa, which goes unnoticed. We since the iPhone was introduced and the mass democratization or uh, um, of smartphones. Now you could be a a Maasai warrior in Tanzania with a smartphone and you have access to the sum total of worlds of humanity's knowledge in your pocket. You have more access to global communications for free today than the president of the U.S. did 30 or 40 years ago. These things are much more profound, much more positive than the daily drivel that you see. I mean, we are living in the most peaceful prosperous time in the history of humanity and yet if you look at news everything is negative and it's actually not the reality now it's not to say that everything is perfect and all the in the best of all possible worlds and by the way we still may get to war (laughs) (laughs) yes we are not we are we are not in a pink world there are uh there is a fundamental inequality is equality of opportunity has decreased. We have a rise of populism. Um, we have somewhat incompetent leaders that could actually lead us down the wrong rabbit holes and war is a possibility. And I really sincerely wish we, we avoid it because overall things are actually pretty amazing. I mean, even if you're in the lower classes today in the West, you have a quality of life and a life expectancy and life outcomes that would be the envy of the kings and emperors of yesteryear. And yes, we have a lot of work to do and we, uh, we are polluting our planets and, 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 but actually even there, I'm an optimist. We have the means within our possession. Um, and frankly, absent even government intervention to actually fix all of these things. There's um, a, a trend just to follow up what you said about uh, really it's called unbreaking news, slow news, unbreaking news. And, and maybe that is the thing we should be pointing to. Uh, do you have any sites that you would recommend uh, to people that are in that vein? The uh, I can't re- to, to not really in general, I avoid news. Uh, so I don't read newspapers. I don't watch cable news. I don't I don't follow news because it's not relevant. Uh, and it's repetitive, it's sensational, and, and I don't think it's quote unquote real news. In terms of what are the good news, the, uh, the I, you can read books like the C. C. Pinker books. Um, there, there is a site that uh, I came across, which uh, I can't remember what it was. The great news, the good news, etc. But I'm, I'm sure. But uh, no, I don't. I don't follow media in, in either direction. I just come across the the, the mass statistics as I read uh, 
books on on the trends in history and, and you can see that the current trend uh, is massively positive especially in the last 200 years hmm. where the technology revolution has increased productivity and and the the fundamental impact of the technology revolution is that it's deflationary it makes things cheaper and the, in the last hundred years, for instance, GDP per capita has tripled, but the cost of food is divided by ten, as we have like mass automation of agriculture, and now we have we have a plentitude of food. Where in the past, even two hundred years ago, all of us were farmers. We'd work seventy hours a week, seven days a week, and would go hungry several times a year. And that's no longer true today we the food is so inexpensive we actually have gone the other direction we're you know obesity ep- epidemic but like that deflationary power of technology and its ability to improve user experiences and decrease costs is continuing to this day i mean we saw it with uber relative taxis but we frankly even in in the grinder scheme of things when we were a kid i i remember my parent my mother my father yelling at my mother oh don't make this long distance phone call it's going to bankrupt us and by long distance she meant he meant like niece calling to paris, paris yeah. yeah he didn't, he wasn't like you're calling china um or, or frankly to even taking the plane like it was a big deal to take a plane when we were young like it was super expensive only the rich took planes and now with uh yield management systems online booking systems uh, automated tra- air traffic control systems the cost of flying is as fundamentally collapsed and now even the middle and lower middle classes and frankly lower classes in the west can afford to go on vacation and take planes the- these are profound op- improvements in their quality of life that people take for granted but they're actually underpinned by the technology revolution that is continuing to this day and the good news is we're only at the beginning i mean mm. only 10 percent of commerce is online Ninety um, percent still offline, and there are many categories from healthcare to education to public services where it's all offline still. And we've had negative productivity because of idiotic regulations and rules and laws that were passed and were counterproductive. And uh, and but it's going to come there, and we are in the cusp of an extraordinary revolution. So the um, unbreaking news site that I wanted to plug was called is called the Correspondent, that Correspondent dot com, which has fifty thousand members. And uh, there's another one coming up in September. So anyway, that's um, to follow what you said. Um, we, you, with your work at FJ Labs, you are you working specifically in marketplaces, and you, you, we talked about the trends there. We don't have time to go into much more, but I did want to just touch back into one area, which, in your in your position and with the knowledge you have, with so much talk about artificial intelligence is good, general intelligence is bad, or you know potential cyber or whatever. What do you see are the trends in AI? So I see AI, by the way, as a tool, as a means to an end. So all of the companies that we invest in, so we don't invest in AI companies directly mm-hmm. that, that build AI, mostly because I suspect that it's going to be commoditized. Uh, today, Google, uh, Microsoft, Facebook, uh, Apple all have an AI, and actually they're making these their, AP, their AI available via APIs where you can actually use them in your products. And so I wouldn't build an AI company per se. Mm-hmm. That said, if you use AI to do interesting things, there's it, it's fundamental in its, in, 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 in its quality improvement. Uh, and, and we're seeing it in marketplaces where now, you know, in the old days, if you want to list an item on an eBay or Le Bon Coin or Craigslist, you would take a photo you would write a description you'd write it you'd write a title you'd pick a category you'd pick a price i mean all this is a lot of work and we're seeing ai and across all the verticals across all the categories now you can just take a photo of an item and the ai will detect the item suggest the the title the category the description the price tags uh, the tags and we'll, we'll tag it we'll we'll I'll do do all the work for you and and so as a as a very effective complement to your life. It's not even a crutch. It's it's like a it's a quality of life improvement. It's absolutely amazing. And and these types of things are happening, frankly, in every vertical in every industry. And so um, it's a form of A and I, uh, if you want to get technical, hmm. uh, or uh, that that is that is highly effective. And it looks to me like we're really far from uh, AGI. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and and by the way, I also don't worry about like the. AI is going to take over all the jobs. First of all, the technology revolution has always created more jobs than it's destroyed. And if if you look at like even the last twenty years, let's go, let's say we go back to nineteen ninety nine, twenty years ago, and I went to people and I told them in twenty years the top four job categories will have been replaced uh, uh, 
by automation. All the bank tellers will have been eliminated. All the travel agents will have been eliminated. All the car uh, manufacturing jobs will have been replaced by robots and automation. And 500 billion of commerce will have gone online, destroying the retail landscape. Please now describe to me the world of 2019. People would have it's the Great Depression, uh, 25% unemployment rate, people have been, you know, living in the streets, it would be the end of the world. And yet we have much lower unemployment than we have today. We have a greater quality of life than we've ever had, um, despite all these job categories being destroyed. Will the trend continue? Absolutely. Um, more and more jobs will be destroyed, but often these are jobs that are not great and or not meant for humans to do. They're they're repetitive and and not interesting. And and the new jobs will most likely be humans working in combination with robots and AI uh, to be even more productive. Where there humans do the things that we do best uh, in terms of like yeah, actually having empathy and 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 human care and touch etc and there are common sense in robots will do things that are repetitive and and frankly not interesting that they're really good at like from pattern recognition to whatever and and it'll be a better world than the one we have today and will many jobs disappear in the, in the process absolutely and will new better jobs be created as well absolutely so i'm profoundly optimistic well, I love that. I especially love this notion of A and I. Would, have you ever had a chance to talk to Elon Musk about it? I have not talked to Elon in a while, actually. Uh, the we, we both um, go to this intellectual conference uh, called Dialogue, organized by uh, Oren Hoffman, though I haven't seen him there in the last few years. So, uh, no, I think he, his concern is more about around artificial general intelligence and mm -hmm. and and it leading to artificial super intelligence and and the the potentially the negative impact that might have mm. i have to admit i am not spending all that much time thinking about it i suspect we're rather far from that yes. outcome and um in the meantime i see amazing extraordinary outcomes that and we still have to think about who's going to regulate this or at least how is it going to be regulated because poor intentions will exist evil forces are out there and uh, that will be the playing field but i'm with you to say that there's a lot of amazing opportunities out there and I'm yeah not... but I, again I, I think you put too much trust in the regulators i find that the regulators often lead to <laughs> to to negative outcomes and by the way uh, even if you try to regulate it, do you think that other countries or other <laughs> bad actors will follow and abide by the regulations? No. I'm, not, I'm not so sure. Well, I, well, I, I think that the the issue with the regulation doesn't necessarily – what I mean sometimes is auto-regulation and, and what is your ethical construct as an individual who's running the company and you regulate it within your company. So I didn't mean necessarily regulation in terms of uh, the law. But um, it's going to be an interesting experience. So Fabrice, um, FJ Labs – uh, Fabrice Grandat, what are the best ways to get in touch with what you are up to? Uh, what's your preferred way of being uh, addressed if someone from listening to this podcast wanted to uh, get in touch with you or at least follow what you do? The So my form of expre creative expression is uh, long form writing, and I have a tendency to write very long blog posts. Uh, so read, uh, you can read about my thinkings uh, and adventures at www.fabricegrinda.com. I'm um, also on um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and you can reach at me there, though I'm much less active and responsive there. Mm -hmm, surely. And anyway, great luck. Thanks for coming on the show, Fabrice. It's been great to listen to you. Um, look forward to catching up with you on a paddle tennis court or in some other wonderful, funky, um, and exceptionally wonderful salon dinner. Thank you. I look forward to uh, seeing you soon. Thanks for having listened to this recording of the Minter Dialogue Show. You'll find the show notes and other blog posts on minterdial.com. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes to give a rating and review. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man. Yeah.
fun I'm a convinced man Challenge my fate I'm a convinced man Competition's in me A convinced man In the arms of a woman Despise revenges and struggle To see Live for the challenge So life's not in What's wrong with challenge? I know soon we all die. I like the feel of a stranger tucked around me, precipitating the danger to feel free, trusting my reason. I'm a 